Addiction is a normal human experience and it is dealt with uh, through normal human coping skills. This is the opinion of psychologist, Dr. Stanton Peel. If you are recovering from an addiction, it is very likely that the information you have on combating your addiction has been influenced by Dr. Peel. In addition to 13 other books subsequently, including his most recent autobiography, A Life on the Edge, My Lonely Quest, uh, which is his right. And there's my copy. Stanton Peel co-wrote the book, Love and Addiction, right there. And perhaps a majority of the clinical psychologists and counselors in the field have read the book. This book sets out a general theory of addiction which includes the idea that addiction is not limited to drugs and drugs are not necessarily addictive. It also maintains that the goal of addiction treatment and recovery is not abstinence to the exclusion of all else, but to build a life that rules out addiction. Now, it is an understatement to say that Stanton is outspoken. With love and addiction, he rose very early to the pinnacle of the psychology profession. Before that, at roughly the age of 26, he was teaching business courses at Harvard. Now he hasn't taught at Harvard for nearly 50 years. And by his own admission, he has been and remains an outlier in the profession for many years. Why? Is it all attributed to his views or is it also because he likes to pick a fight with people? Two weeks ago, we attempted this interview for the first time. <laughs> After that interview, my co-host and colleague quit the show <laughs> and forbade us to publish the episode. So we scrapped that interview and I'm here now for round two. Stanton, I am honored to have you on the show. Welcome, sir. Ian, it's great to be back. And I'm going to doff my cap to you. In my memoir, <clears throat> I mentioned along the way that in my lifetime in the field, which is 50 years now, mm -hmm. um, the number of cases where somebody is ensconced in an organization or an operation, and I present and that person may be sympathetic to me, but their organization or their colleagues react against me. Mm. Number of times where the person has said, you know, I'm just going to have to let Stanton speak because I think his ideas have some value. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm going to stand up for him here. Honestly, it's less than the fingers on two hands where that's occurred. Mm. So I'm in your debt, Ian. Um, you, you fall into a small group of people who's willing to say, uh, perhaps offend some people, lose some relationships even, by saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm responding to some truths that Stan has to say, and I think we ought to hear them. Again, oh. I'm going to drop my cap to you. It, it you're certainly worth listening to. You're certainly worth reading. And I, I, I quite frankly believe I'm in the majority in with that opinion. Now, um, uh, as my memoir and as you introduced me, I sometimes seem as though I want to push away any possible support. I think you gave a very accurate description of my origins and my point of view. Mm. I never use the term recovery. Mm. recovery is a reactive word in other words you're saying well you are addicted that's your perch in life recover from it the life process program which we'll discuss perhaps a little bit more no. later is about gaining a perch on life we're about you're going to overcome and avoid addiction to the extent that you're able to be a participant 
and involved and engaged in your own life in the universe. That's the goal. Mm. We're not recovering against something. We're moving to be attached to something, relationships, purpose, work, values. And so uh, from the start, the whole AA thing, which starts from a position of weakness and self-labeling has never worked for me. Right. Um, you're addicted for life. You're, you're in permanent recovery in that model. I have a colleague now. I work with Zach Rhodes, who's a developmental person. He works in the yes. school system. Uh, not that kids and adults are two different things, but you would never say to a kid, I, I think we've gone away from that with kids, you are disabled. That is who you are. We've gone away from that. Hmm. We say, well, you're a person with perhaps some areas of weakness. But our goal as educators, as parents, as developmental specialists is to allow you to engage in life as fully as possible. And that's a pretty good template for dealing with people with addiction type problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I understand personally that for in my anecdotal experience anyway, um, there is a significant number of people who find it advantageous at least to declare to themselves and to everyone they know that they choose to disclose this to, I am uh, an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict or uh, I am addicted to something and I abstain I'm in recovery and I'm never going to use again. And they're congratulated for that. And they, and they stand by that abstinence and it becomes a beacon of light for them in their, in their world. Um, very powerful experience. And I think that is one of the great endorsements of the AA abstinence model which I think a lot of people find difficult to, you know, they find it difficult to get their heads around the idea that, hey, maybe there's some alcoholics out there, for example, who could recover from alcoholism and then take a drink later in life and find themselves a moderate drinker. That's, that's anathema. Well, those are two different uh... Okay. These are two different things. Okay. I mean, because even the people, and I, I'm guessing you know quite a few of people like this, even people who are in AA who say, well, I'm never going to drink again, that harm reduction thing, let's leave that aside. Yeah. There are people who are in AA who joined 20 or 30 years ago or less, and you're looking at them and you're saying, that's not the same person who joined AA. This right. is not a person who's about to, I mean, if God forbid, they uh, had a dessert and it turned out that it had rum in it, yeah. they're not going to go back out on the street. No. They're in a different place in life. And uh, you talk about the power of the AA experience for some people at a moment in time. Mm -hmm. Can, what would you say are the downsides to that experience, to that swearing i am an alcoholic well i think the downsides are pretty clear in that if you fall off the wagon then um it appears to you and to many that uh, that you being the person the, the person who is uh, addicted um that You've lost all the, you've lost and you're back to using and you have to start again and all is lost, right? There's, there's no middle ground. It's all or nothing. So a, a majority perhaps, a, certainly a, a significant group of people that join AA or try to find themselves alienated by the, that, that uh, pressure. Say, so I can't, I can't do it. Now, you and I are both helpers, therapists. 
somebody could say, well, there's some good things about AA. You talked a little bit about it might get a person over the hump. You might talk about the group support. There are a couple of things about AA that are stunningly wrong to me. And mm -hmm. one of them is, I'll just give a hypothetical situation, except I, I know people that this is true for. They haven't had a drink for 10 years. Mm. They have a drink. Maybe they have more than one drink. Maybe they only have one drink. And now you just mentioned this, their chits are taken away from them and they're back to ground zero as though those 10 years don't matter. Right. How can that possibly be considered therapeutic? How can you tell people, you know, you've, you've obviously made some gains in life. Yeah. That's what you used to be intoxicated daily. And now you haven't been intoxicated for a decade. Who doesn't recognize that as an improvement? Why would you take that away, remove that slice of their life and throw it in the trash can? It, it, that's just, there's some things from AA that could be said positive things about, can be defended, but that's unfathomable to me. Hmm. I think that uh, that 10 years experience obviously is extremely valuable. And I doubt that a, a majority of people would discount that experience. They'd say that was a tremendous achievement. You've got to repeat the act. You've got to do it again. And you're going back to zero in your chips though yeah 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 if you have a client and now we're getting down to the fundamentals of harm reduction mm -hmm. you have a client and you work with them for a month or six months or a year yeah and they've made significant improvements let's go back to the child thing again you want to reinforce that i mean that's how people you it's most obvious with child you want to reinforce their positive behavior and expansion of their lives. Right. Affirmation. Affirmation. I, I think they have to find the strength to believe in themselves, to understand their own strengths. And everyone has strengths. I don't care who you are, right? Well, let's get <laughs> set. We're getting back to AA now. In AA, before you list your strengths, well, you sort of never list your strengths. Yeah. You list the things you've done wrong. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'm going to re I'll refer to your role as a therapist or a helper. You and I know many people who are very preoccupied with all the things they've done wrong. Yes. I mean, with a long list of them. Yeah. And sometimes it's so obvious. They use the word affirmation people change the best when they feel the best about themselves and the strongest so in the life process program mm -hmm. we ask them to list you know well they've got a problem that's why they they don't we don't pick them up off the street mm -hmm. they've called in or you know linked in so there's something on their mind but we say we'd like to review your positives in your life both successes you've had in the past and assets that you have right now mm -hmm. have, well at least two purposes in doing that uh, one is we want people to feel empowered we want them to like for example somebody might come in with a drinking problem they quit smoking mm -hmm. so you say well you know you're not exactly naive about giving up addictions you've done that already absolutely yeah and then b people the data all say the same thing and it's just common sense people do better when they've got more strengths and positives and supports in their life a, a guy who's living on the street is going to have significantly lower level of recovery than somebody who is embedded in a family and has say a good career and good positives in their work world. Mm. It's we're not saying anything brilliant here. I mean, one of the worst accusations possibly that could be made against me is not that I'm violating what everybody knows. It's that I'm just saying the most commonsensical things. Yeah. And again, I go back to the child thing. 
because virtually everybody these same principles um they know about it with child if their child has some problem bedwetting biting their nails uh, whatever a parent is going to be positively reinforced when they do well in school when they have friends when they have success on the athletic field everybody knows those are buttressing the individual and they're going to do better with whatever the concern we have. Right. Right. And we have, however, we, as therapists, we're, I think, consistently confronted with clients who don't have a lot of those advantages. And it's the lack of those advantages and the fallout from that, which can be lifelong, that is their in some cases, their life's work to recover from. And, and as a therapist, sometimes you can really acutely be aware of how difficult it is for the client to really cope because of their earlier circumstances or their present day circumstances, which often are a result, a cascading result of adverse circumstances in childhood or youth. Now, let me ask you a question, Ian. Uh, you work within an EAP framework, yes. right? Yes. So you know people who have a job. Yes, I do. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we're uh, there are people we could talk about who live on the street. That's a category of person. Yes. Your client base is not that. They're people who got hired to do a job. They show up every morning. Right. Or they're the relatives of the uh, person who has the job. All right. So they're in a stable relationship with a husband or a wife who has a job. Well, Maybe I'm easily impressed, Ian, but the very things that you talk about, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are people on the street and that's, you have to think a little bit harder, don't you, about where we're going to go with them. The clients that you and I deal with, obviously, in the life process program, they're calling into the internet, they have a credit card. I'm immediately struck by how many things they've got in place in life. Yes. They're, they're making money. They can get it together to make appointments and show up in the internet and talk with me. They have a primary relationship. Those are not trivial things. And and one reason we know they're not trivial things is because there are quite a few people in the United States today who don't have those things. I mean, we're aware that there's a declining yeah. lifespan for people who are the least attached to life, single, unemployed, um, deprived, um, right. not part of a family or a community. So obviously we can turn our we have to be aware of those people and what we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, maybe it's too strong. You and I have a privileged clientele compared to what's... Yes. Um, I think we have, I, I, I at least, uh, with the EAP experience, Employment Assistance Program experience, uh, we have an employed clientele or uh, or relatives of employees of client companies of my employer um but you know i have for example met many accomplished people who have a wonderful family etc you know they they tick all the boxes however there's an issue and it, and the issue often is addiction. Uh, do you think I'm going to jump the gun, jump the lane here? Was Paul Newman an alcoholic? I don't know, quite frankly. There's a series on Netflix or whatever where his children say and other people say he's an alcoholic. Um I, I among I don't use the term recovery. I don't use the term funk. They, they use the term functioning. It used to be called functional alcohol. Yes. Um. When you've been nominated for Academy Awards in five different decades, 
when you started a multi-million dollar charity. Yeah. When you've been married to the same woman for 50 years, he had a child from his first marriage yes. who died. Uh, his children, some of them can gripe about him because he's a man whose focus wasn't always on the family. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's perfect or good. I'm not going to call a person like that an alcoholic. No, I never I mean, knew Paul Newman. He was never my client. Um, but, you know, Paul Newman was a phenomenon. He, uh, he an extraordinary individual in terms of his career. He had um, uh, the opportunity that matched the talent that, that matched his work ethic. He obviously worked very hard, right? And was focused and, you know, very accomplished as a result extremely rare to have those qualities in your life so newman's a phenomenon right but people call him uh in the uh, netflix or whatever series they call him an alcoholic mm. uh so wouldn't you say we're throwing out whatever the term is the uh, grain with the chafe or whatever the hell it is if you're going to call Paul newman an alcoholic uh, let's go back. There's something called the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. Yes. And it has, uh, and at the beginning it says, there's only one way you get in this book. If you're impaired and you're distressed. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example. You don't automatically ca categorize somebody as schizophrenic because they have hallucinations. They're only schizophrenic if their hallucinations prevent them from having relationships, from having a life, and from working. Right. Let's get back to the life process program. We're about attaching Very powerful people. rationale. You have to, we're about attaching people to life. And within that framework, an awful lot of people have some negatives and uh, some things that fall in the addiction type category, some preoccupations, some psychological peculiarity. When they write a memoir about somebody, 95 times, they're famous. That's why they're writing a, a bio, you yeah. know, biography. It's profitable to write about famous people. 99 times out of 100, there's going to be some revelation in there mm. that's going to be shocking. You know, I mean, Charles Dickens had a wife, but he had a young mistress for many, a younger mistress for many decades. Mm. Oh, and in the light, we uh, you, do you judge people? Do you have a tendency to judge people even when they come in and they reveal something they're doing that's kind of not kosher? How do you react to that? I do not judge. That it's uh, non judgment is a fundamental, it's a cornerstone of my practice. It has to be as a, as a psychotherapist. So you can't be, um, I don't know, there's a lot of ways to put this. You can't be more distressed than they are. Um, when somebody reveals they're going to talk to you and they've got some guilt ridden secret often. Yeah. And um, in many cases, we think, well, they're blaming themselves for something that wasn't their fault. I don't get into any any of that. I'm always going to be less distressed than they are about what their problem is. I'm going to address their distress, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to label or address their problem. I'm not going to go, oh, my God, you did that? Um, because they've, already, they've come to you already right. because that's milling around in their mind. Yeah. And again, I'm going to go back to a kid. And maybe this is simple minded to me. When a kid has done something and they kind of have to confess, if they admit to something, you've got to let them go. You've got to let them get off the hook because that's the only way they're going to be allowed to be honest and especially be honest and accepting of themselves. I, I think what you're saying is um, they, they have, you have to. Uh, recognize their humanity 
and allow them their humanity and and allow and and facilitate if you will or encourage them to be in touch with their humanity i am enough i am forgivable i can be forgiven i am forgiven he goes if you don't have that you ain't got nothing and um and so, you know, in the Life Process Program and my approach to addiction, um, you, I'm going to get back to the, the 12 steps is about recycling your past problems and asking for forgiveness from them. Yeah. You know, I'm not against if you if you owe somebody money, God willing, go pay them. But I start at ground zero. Mm. I start saying, well, OK, you're here with me. Well, first of all, nobody comes here. Nobody's perfect. Let's just start with that. In case you have that thought in your mind, forget that. Mm. On second of all, you're here because you're guilty. I mean, Paul Newman had a son who ended up, who died somewhere around drugs from his first marriage. Mm. So maybe he's thinking, I don't know. I didn't spend enough time with him. You know what I mean? I didn't show him I loved him. Um, but, it, you know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure that the phenomena of Paul Newman, the public figure aside, he was uh, a human being like the rest of us. He put his pants on one leg at a time, ate breakfast, you know, and uh, just just hung out like the rest of us. Um, he was just a guy, I'm sure. And if he did drink too much, again, we're, this is all projection, although you can watch the documentary and decide for yourself. It's possible that he was drinking somewhat around that distress. Mm. And we're not God. We can't forgive somebody from what they did and what they shouldn't have done. But we can say, you know, we're starting at ground zero here. Uh, you and I are working together to improve your future of mm. yourself and your family and the world. Mm. We're not. Uh, we can't undo the past. And, and I don't. I may, I don't know in your I know people who've had children die. Paul Newman's not the first one I've heard of that. Yes. Um, and if they're parents, what are we going to do now? Are we going to say, well, that's it. Your life's over. Mm. You, know, you had a child who died by their own hand, let's say, mm. one way or another. Yes. Your life's over. Why don't you kill yourself? That's not the deal. Um I would say to them, at some point, we might want to think about, so if you have other children too, mm. um, what's, an, what's a better way to go about dealing, you know, how could you have improved that? But we're, we're not, we're cutting our bait at that story there. Right. And Paul Newman had six children. You've got five children that you're probably, again, we're not just you're probably screwing I, up more or less with now let's just work on that i think you're saying life is complicated you know um i have a question um you said love addiction is the most dangerous addiction i've heard you say that and i think that's a pretty clear message in love and addiction the book it is the most um um what is love addiction and why is it so dangerous Love addiction is when you become attached to another person as your whole identity and the consequences and fundamentals of that relationship are negative in the sense that it tears you down and that you may be engaged equally in tearing another person down. Um, there are love addiction stories that I can tell. You can read them in the newspaper every day. Sure. Um, uh, Unfortunate stories, many of them. And where people, well, they kill somebody. Yeah. Or they commit suicide. Terrible. Uh, if you go back to s some of these uh, mass shooting stories are ones where somebody's gone in because uh, a partner has left them and they're going to, you know, they're going to kill their ex-wife and all of their relatives. And Sometimes they even kill their children. Mm, yeah. You know, um, quitting smoking can be very, very difficult. Quitting heroin can be very, very difficult. 
I'm I'm hardly aware of any human being who's committed suicide when they quit smoking. They may complain mm -hmm. a lot. They may relapse. It's a good point. <laughs> but when somebody loses their lover, there are people who just give up on life one way or another, their own life, or they fear nothing matters and they're just going to kill that other person. And then you have to say, wow, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Because in a love relationship, addicts have a difficult time and let's not even use it. People who are addicted to cigarettes, shopping, eating, they feel that's the only way that they can process themselves through life. Mm. And our therapeutic work is we don't believe that and we can help them. And they're already doing other things is to expand that pool of things that aren't the addiction. Mm. There are people who feel that their life won't go on if they're deprived of another human being. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, you, you, you can't argue anyone out of an addiction. That The Light Brothers program uses motivational techniques. Um, for, for example, let's. I, I think you might think I'm watching too much uh, uh, streaming television. <laughs> they just did the uh, Princess Diana story. Yes. When she was pregnant with her second child, she threw herself down the steps and said she was trying to commit suicide. She already had one son and mm. she was pregnant. Nobody, just because they're quitting heroin or smoking, nobody does that. Right. Yeah. And uh, she felt completely desolate and isolated in this first period because she married a man and devoted her life to him. And it turns out he was already taken. It, he already had a primary yeah. love relationship with right. somebody else. And so she's thinking, I've given my life. She was eight, 19 when she met him. A devastating I, experience for anyone, but to, uh, to be in the position in life that she was and to be as young as she was, excruciatingly difficult, I'm sure. And, you know, we just sit, we could meditate on a pregnant woman tries to commit suicide. Mm. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of clients, even who are that bad off, no matter what their addiction is. Yeah. yeah. And it turned out, of course, in a way, she was a success story. She turned her life around. She became a public figure. She had a good relationship with her sons. She devoted herself to helping AIDS foundations and dealing with landmines. She's a perfect example of life process program. How did she get over being a desolate about her love, a destructive love relationship? Um, she got over it by becoming invested in her children and by, by coming up with purpose. Purpose is extremely important in addiction in the life process program to help other people and to make the world a better place. And, and I think so one, I of the, one of to the- To feel profound, valuable yourself. Yeah, one of the profound characteristics of Princess Di was her ability to develop a sense of purpose mm -hmm. to trans, that transcended her situation that was becoming increasingly apparent in the public mind and yet here she is with this um, purpose that's transcending this impressed the public no end i think and let's go back to our job as a helper yeah she was that and again this is what's wrong with the aa and the whole uh, a biological medical model of, it, of addiction, you could say, well, she was depressed. And that's a thing. Mm -hmm. She's a depressed person. You could say that. But that she didn't die depressed. She found her own inner resources to overcome. And she had those resources even when she was trying to commit suicide. Yeah. So let's go back to our job as a helper. You could say, oh, my God, what a wreck. Uh she tried to commit suicide when she was pregnant. That's 
that's the epitome of depression. She doesn't care about her own life and the life of her unborn child. But then you would miss the fact that here was a human being. So as a therapist, you could have already known that if you explored her life with her, that she was a helper in school. She was a helper. She liked to help people. Yeah. That was a gift that she had, an asset that she had. And so in a therapeutic relationship, you might say, um, you seem to get great joy out of being helpful and making other people feel better. Is that true? You know, not everybody is able to be that you 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 mean. Right. Do you recognize that about yourself that you're have a person of value and that you have a gift. I'm I'm hurrying up the therapeutic process here. No. But you can see you would interact with her to make her appreciate the strengths that were there that came out that right. would have come out if she committed suicide. I, it brings us to another question. Um, you have said that community is crucial to recovery. Um, if community is crucial, what do we need to, uh, to fix in our communities? And what is wrong with our communities in the present day? Well, uh, I have something uh, you, you may be aware. Uh, the death toll from drugs has risen asymptotically. Yeah. It's, at the in twenty twenty one, it was one hundred and seven thousand. Yeah. In two thousand, it was seventeen thousand five hundred. Something's not going right, and it, that pays one of the biggest crises of this particular crisis written era and a good part of that crisis and you can trace the whole trump thing back to it too is the number of people that feel disattached to purpose their own futures to the united states and to their own communities and so you and i uh, you know are doing our little best to try and help people that come to us yeah the president of the united states can't fix those things he can, that's his job and he's got to try um and we should be good citizens and make an effort to do that mm -hmm. but we have to help people repair communities within their context of their own lives we're not going to make the united states whole yeah. and so in the life process program we say are there any, uh, well, who matters to you in your life? And they, most people already have some community. They have a family, they have friends, they have a work community in your environment. Mm -hmm. um, they live somewhere, maybe they belong to a church or a synagogue. Uh, maybe uh, they have a strong interest in something like maybe they belong to an exercise or a fishing club. Everything that attaches people to other human beings that helps them appreciate and be appreciated and to work in a collaborative way with other things is an improvement of expanding their sense of community. Mm. And so, you know, we're not God. We have to recognize our limitations. But a, one strong context, one part of the Life Process Program is being aware of intimate relationships, being aware of family, being aware of the communities that you're already a part of or that you could potentially join and to strengthen and enhance those. We, we might be talking about harm reduction. Mm. Some people think of harm, and I know you've, we've had a little bit of this discussion already. Yeah. There used to be something called controlled drinking. Mm -hmm. And controlled drinking was the idea, well, you're an alcoholic and now you can become a controlled drinker. I I've have never thought of controlled clients drinking. that are fans of controlled drinking, whether they know it or not. Uh, you know, so I, harm, would, reduction, <laughs> harm reduction is a much broader term. Yeah. Harm reduction says we're not going to focus, and you mentioned this earlier, we're not going to focus primarily on abstinence or your addiction. We're going to focus primarily on what you have going for you in life and what you want to value and how you want to expand. We want to expand that part of it, mm -hmm. in which case there'll be less time left for addiction. And so um, harm reduction then becomes, I mean, specifically it becomes, well, 
we don't want you to go out and binge all night. Um, if you do drink, we want you to moderate your drinking. We certainly want you to drink or take drugs in a safe context. That's the tip of the iceberg. We don't want them to die in a car accident or evades or anything like that. Mm. But then as we get down further beyond that, we want them to be able to uh, expand the positives in their life so that there's just a downward trend to the base of successful functioning. Mm. Harm reduction, we have to avoid over-defining harm reduction in technique in specific terms oh you drink x number of glasses of alcohol a week or during a day i define harm reduction as improving your life so let's you began by talking about a population that you don't work with directly yeah there are people who roam the streets drinking well i i i'm quite old i'm 76 i used to hitch i lived grew up until i used to hitchhike to new york and there was a part of was New York. It was possible in your day. What's that? It was possible to hitchhike in your day, much yeah. more than it is today. I would go to the turnpike exit, exit six on the Pennsylvania turnpike. I would get a ride there. Yeah. People would stop and they'd be headed to New York and say, can you give me a lift? And they did. They would. I remember hitchhikers. Sure. And there used to be a part of New York where people, they drank all day, that was a thing. And they lived in single room occupancy hotels. That was a, a life. Yeah. That area is all owned by NYU now. I don't know where all those people went. There were no more SROs mm. in that part of New York City, but let's leave that aside. Um, they did a study and they have that in Seattle. They have a skid row in Seattle. And here's what they did. They gave them a hotel where they could drink as much as they want in the hotel. What do you think about that? It's called wet housing. Yeah, I think it was a uh, very courageous experiment. I think uh, there was some uh, professionals behind that uh, particular endeavor that must have had a lot of courage. And one of them was the Alamar lad. He's dead, mm -hmm. but he studied the results of it. Now, they didn't require them to drink less, mm -hmm. but they drank less. And uh, the population averaged 18 drinks a day. And at the end of six months, they drank 12 drinks a day, which is still not moderate drinking. Why do you think they drank less when they had this wet housing residence? I think it was probably because they didn't have... The the same sense of urgency when they uh, came across alcohol in one way or another, they didn't have to drink it all at once or hoard it or otherwise defend themselves. Uh, they knew that they would have an adequate supply. So that's a pragmatic thing. Yeah. Well, in the street, you have to drink all your alcohol or you're going right. to lose. But I think there's something more fundamental going on. And, and when they interviewed them in a separate study, and they said, and they're not, I don't want you to start crying on me, Ian. Some of them said, this is the first person, this is the first time people have ever treated me as though my life mattered. Very powerful. Very powerful. And so, and then you could throw in a concept like self-advocacy where they could say, well, I'm in charge of my own little space here. I got to keep it clean. I mean, the requirements of wet housing. Yeah. You can drink, but, you know, you can't screw up the whole place. You can't go pee in the corner. You know, it's, right. it's a deal. There are rules. Which I, I, I'm guessing that that population that would be attracted to become um, uh, residents there would, if not appreciate the rules, would be willing to follow them, you know, because their humanity is being recognized. Say, hey, so we, we began this by your, you know, you're saying, well, Stanton, it's nice. You can talk about controlled drinking. Oh, you might live in New York. You might have a clientele who are stockbrokers or, you know, people who call the white brothers and they got a credit card. Um, but there are people in the world in the United States who just are, they're not functioning at that level. 
but the same principles mm. allowing people to have some control over their life uh, and requiring some responsibility of them and investing them with some humanity, it works. I mean, the, the scale is different. Mm. We're not measuring, oh, well, they're a controlled drinker. They only have two or three drinks a day and no more than 15, whatever defines that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's another example of where harm reduction is a matter. If you remember my definition of harm reduction, in place of recovery is you focus on the person's overall life improvement and capacity. Yes. That's what we're improving and that's what we're measuring. And in general, as a rule of thumb, their addictive behavior is going to lessen at the same time as that part of their life increases and is enhanced. Mm -hmm. Their addictive behavior is going to lessen. Yeah. So, um, you you are against the disease model of addiction. That Everybody that. knows that. You're known for this, I think. Um, the disease model, of course, suggests addiction has a biological, neurological, genetic, or environmental source of origin. Um, and the disease model is very widespread today. I think I have clients come to me routinely who uh, recount uh, an a assessment of self-assessment that essentially is based on the disease model. Why does America and Canada and increasingly global so society embrace the disease model? I'm so glad you brought that up. I'll, I'll tell you a story about me in Canada. Um, I've had a rich and varied life. If you read my memoir. Yes. I was invited to speak at Insight, which is uh, was an infection site in Vancouver, and to talk to their counselors. And the woman who ran that, Liz Evans, she's not intellectual, she's a doer. And she created housing. We talked about housing. Yeah. She created banks. A lot of people got checks and they had no place to put them. Yeah. She created bakeries and jobs. So she, she was doing a life process program, but she's she's not a life she's not a therapy maven. Mm. She just does things. Right. I taught. I said, "Wow, they're putting into practice what I believe in." I was stunned to find out when I talked about addiction to what extent their own counselors, despite their embodying a totally opposite approach, endorsed the disease model because. Well, that's what you go to college and that's what they teach you. Mm. Let me just mention two amazing things. The disease model has disproved itself. Mm. Tom, do you know the name Thomas Insel, I-N-S-C-L? Yes. He was the head of National Institute of Mental Health from 2004 to 2000, 2002. Yes, of course. He's the biggest neuro guy. Addiction is a uh, not a big, he's mental health, illness is a neuro thing. He, after he resigned or graduated, he wrote a memoir and he said, We've spent multi billions on brain disease models. He could afford to say that at that time. <laughs> and we haven't got one thing, to sh not we haven't, not only have we gotten not one thing to show for it, there is no brain disease cure for addiction, uh, mental illness. Yeah, that's hard. But from 1990 till the present, mental health outcomes have gone down in the United States. Everybody mm -hmm. he knows it, and they did a study, an international study, National National uh, Academy of Sciences. There, they classified 17 nations as wealthy. Mm -hmm. Whatever you can guess what that means, right. New Zealand, right, France. And only one of those nations has the lifespan decline. And that was the United States, was it not? And the World Health Organization. That was the United States. The wow. World Health Organization on June 17th, the World Health Organization convened a, uh, whatever you call it, a webinar or symposium on mental health outcomes around the world and they're going down in the world in general yeah 
and they have a shtick that they've been pushing for 20 years. And I'll give the, the label for that shtick is something we've already brought up. It's community mental health. Yes. They say uh, all of those 16 nations compared to the United States have more community oriented resources. The United States doesn't believe in, you have to fight to get people to help people that we don't. You're a nation of individualists. Right. And who can that that? <laughs> Damn that Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. You know, they make great movie stars, but, um, and, and self-efficacy and empowerment is important. But in general, most the problems that most people face are a lack of support for who they are as human beings and as individuals. Mm -hmm. You can just roam the streets in America and nobody gives a shit. Back to, so World Health Organization for some 20 years has been pushing community mental health programs. Community mental health programs are not disease programs. Mm -hmm. They're human support programs. And you know, it's not a miracle of medical thinking. It's giving people a place to live. It's looking after their health so that they can take care of their infections. It's giving them purpose by giving them education and giving them jobs. It's giving them social support. I mean, we're not talking, you know, uh, Einsteinian and Einsteinian nuclear right. physics here. Your grandmother knew these things. Sure. And they're, and they're saying... And ironically, the United States spends hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions on something, imagining that we're going to furrow, burrow into the brain and find the cure for mental illness. And Intel sort of had to admit that was his whole gig. He said, well, that's failed. Right. Um, and we're in the midst of he's. Uh, he, he graduated. I mean, he wasn't fired. Mm. You know, he's, I'm sure he's doing fine, whatever he's doing now. Uh, I might say something slightly controversial now. I hope you can deal with it. He had a compatriot named Nora Volko, who continues to be the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Yes, of course. She remains committed to that brain disease model. Yes. She came in in 2003. You've criticized her at length, I think. We'll have to get her on the show. Uh, not, I'm not on her Christmas uh, shopping list and uh, or Hanukkah shopping list. Mm. And um, um, there were 23,000 deaths a year when she came in in 2003. There were 107,000 to 2021 drug deaths. You know, in most jobs, you'd be in danger of losing your job if you know that your gig is the national institute on drug abuse yeah a multiple 10 times or seven times as many people have died somebody might say we realize you've tried your best but your approach isn't working we're going to bring somebody else in here now that's not going to happen I, gets think back to the the, I think she's carried the day for the banner of uh, the, the disease model and she's done it well. And that is her, those are her credentials, if you will. And Which why? Keeps her, uh, it keeps her in office. In 2017, the magazine, the journal Nature, um, published an editorial which said essentially the world needs to be more like Nora Volko looking for brain solutions to addiction. That was 2017. Um, in 2018, they published the Global Burden of Disease Report. Among 196 nations in the world, the United States was second worst in the loss of life to disability and death due to drug use. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and you're sort of wondering, you mean, I can't, I can't name 10 nations. You mean we're worse than Borneo? We're worse than Ghana? We're worse than the Dominican Republic? We're worse than Russia? We're worse than everybody, let alone, you know, comparably wealthy nations. And here, and so you ask the question, why does the disease model continue to expand despite 
nobody in America thinks we're doing well with drugs. You yeah, know? I, I think that, uh, you know, the disease model um, and the, uh, the psychology profession is encountering uh, a moment like many uh, disciplines are encountering at the moment where they are realizing to their great chagrin that there is no magic bullet that whatever we're facing right now both within the the discipline of psychology and without uh, the society at large there's no easy solutions there is a long hard road ahead in terms of working out the specifics of how to beat addiction, how to maintain a psychologically healthy life, how to in encourage psychological health at large within the community. There's no magic bullet. There's no drug. You've, you've already, uh, we're coming to the end of our time together and you already no. gave my summary. Um, there's no way Americans, more than anybody, believe in that magical medical solution for mental illness and addiction. Mm. There's no, as you said, there's no easy way. The only way we're, and everybody sort of knows this. Everybody knows that drug deaths are increasing. They call them deaths of despair. Everybody knows that as an individual client or versus the entire society, we have to enhance people's attachment to life their motivation to live, their attachment to other human beings, their feelings of purpose. And somebody might say, they might sneer and say, oh, who are you? God or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington? Uh, but what I have to say, both as a policy person in terms of the life process program, was what you just said so eloquently. There is no shortcut to avoiding or overcoming addiction or mental illness beyond improving people's lived experience on this planet, mm -hmm. individually within a group that we work with or within our communities or within society. And so we don't have the matter, we don't have, we're nobodies. We're not, if, if the president can't make, make that barely happen, um, all we can do is to try and enhance those things with the people that we work with, which is what the Life Process Program does. One, and as individual citizens. Yeah. Ian, I no, I don't think we should, we have forced people to listen to our brilliance for uh, longer than an hour. And so I want to just reiterate that um, there aren't many times in my life, as I say in my memoir, where people have said, oh, that's Stanton Beale. He's such a pain in the ass. Uh, I think we might want to listen to him. And then when people object to it, they just throw me overboard. I, I call it my lonely quest to change how we see addiction. You put yourself on the line. You created a whole new show for me. So I doff my cap to you, Ian. Oh, you're most welcome, Stanton. It's an honor. And um, let's stay in touch. My pleasure. Okay. Au revoir, Ian. And we'll see you Peace. soon. Bye.